Social Amnesia by Russell Jacoby. Chapter 6. Theory and Therapy 1. Freud. Not in any beyond, but here on earth, most men live in a hell. Schopenhauer has seen that very well. My knowledge, my theories, and my methods have the goal of making men conscious of this hell so that they can free themselves from it. That was a quotation by Sigmund Freud himself. <clears throat> in the history of psychoanalysis, as in the history of Marxism, reformist practices threaten to supplant and suppress theory. Revisionism of both schools, psychoanalytic and Marxist, crept toward a pragmatism impatient with a non-utilitarian no theory and reflection. As has been discussed, the most recent forms of revisionism are the byproducts of social amnesia and a cult of subjectivity, themselves products of an administered society. In the name of authenticity and progress, the very theory that could comprehend both is phased out as dated and, ups and obsolete. Without a critical theory, analyses inside and outside a left degenerate into common sense and prefabricate prefabricated slogans. The repression of theory in the name of efficient practice takes its revenge by returning as malpractices, pseudo-therapy and phony revolution. Critical theory resist, resists pragmatic or Marxist calls for the instant identity of theory and practice. This is to be quickly attained only by the suppression of theory. Rather, critical theory seeks to preserve the contradiction of theory and practice by enunciating it. The relationship between theory and practice, in general, cannot be compressed into a single formula. It is a highly complex historical relationship. Theory is not to be reduced to practice nor cleanly severed from it. The identity of theory and practice is to be achieved in a non-antagonistic society. Till then, the relationship can only be one of conscious contradiction. Within psychoanalysis, the same relationship of theory and practice is preserved, though in a different form. Psychoanalysis is a theory of society and civilization as a whole, as well as immediate practice, therapy for the individual, Marcuses. Therapy for the individual. Marcuse subtitled Eros and Civilization, a philosophical inquiry into Freud, and wrote that the book is concerned with theory, not therapy. No therapeutic argument should hamper the development of a theoretical construction which aims not at curing individual sickness, but at diagnosing the general disorder. The most serious objection of the Frankfurt School to the Neo-Freudians turned exactly on this point. They weakened the theory of psychoanalysis in favor of therapy. Psychoanalysis as individual therapy necessarily participates within the realm of social unfreedom, while psychoanalysis as theory is free to transcend and criticize this same realm. To take up only the first moment, psychoanalysis as therapy is to blunt psychoanalysis as a critique of civilization, turning it into an instrument of individual adjustment and resignation. The point is not to play one against the other, both theory and therapy exist within Freud in contradiction. The innovations and revisions necessary on therapy, therapeutic grounds are not identical with the imperatives of the theory. Changes in the former can proceed without changes in the latter because the locus in each case is different. One take the individual as ill, the other civilization as ill. One takes the individual as ill, the other civilization as ill. Measures take to cure the individual measures taken to cure the individual are not identical with those taken to cure the civilization. To a point they diverge. The right to such reorientations in the interest of successful therapy and practice is not questioned here. Marcuse wrote of the Neo Freudians, but the revisionists have converted the, the weakening of Freudian theory into a new theory. This is what is crucial that the contradiction between theory and therapy is lost, not that changes are made in the name of therapy. Yet this is not to be mismade or misconstrued, sorry. Yet this is not to be misconstrued to indicate there is no relationship between the general theory and the individual therapy, 
and that theory ignores therapy. Rather, the, the relationship is dialectical. In individual or individual therapy must necessarily forget the whole so as to aid um, in indivi its individual victim. How exactly it does this is in part irrelevant to theory. As Brown, whose discussion parallels Marcuse's, wrote, psychoanalytic therapy as a, parallel, as a technique can be judged only pragmatically. Anything goes if it works. This is not to be criticized, or if criticized, only when that which works is called liberation or growth. Theoretically, what Adorno wrote remains true. In adjusting to the mad hole, the cured patient becomes really sick. The acuteness of Freud as bourgeois thinker is here again glimpsed. He unflinchingly articulated contradictions and refrained from, from blurring them in the name of therapy or harmony. From his early writings to his last no his last no attempt is made to reconcile individual therapy with the meta theory of psychoanalysis. They exist in contradiction. Insofar as civilization was repression, individual therapy was education in repression, albeit conscious repression. Freud's concluding words from his first book with Brewer, Studies in Hysteria, remain a scandal to therapists who would forget the theory so as to promote the therapy. Freud enunciated and distinguished these two moments. He cited the typical remarks of a patient who complains that, you say yourself that my suffering has probably much to do with my own relations and destinies. You cannot change any of that. In what manner then can you help me? To this I could always answer. I do not doubt at all that it would be easier for fate than for me to remove your sufferings. But you will be convinced that much will be gained if we succeed in transforming your hysterical misery into everyday unhappiness. If the goal of everyday unhappiness is not one that today's therapists will inscribe on their banners, it is the unwavering appraisal of the real possibilities and limitations of individual therapy. So too would Freud in one of his last papers, um, Analysis Terminable and Interminable, emphasize the minimal change that could be expected from therapy. The difference between a person who is not and a person who has been analyzed is, after all, not so radical as we endeavor to make it and expect and assert that it will be. Freud was very much alive to the dangers of theory being absorbed by therapy. His terms were different, but the formulation was the same as Marcuse's critique of psychological revisionism. The immediacy of therapy or reforms rendered irrelevant a theory that promised nothing for the here and now but truth. The practical and immediate gains of therapy convinced the pragmatists that an unworkable theory was extraneous. Yet to Freud, as to those who resist revisionism within Marxism, theory is to be preserved for the very reason that the revisionists rejected it, because it is true and not because it is practical in the here and now. Psychoanalysis is a theory of an unfree society that necessitates psychoanalysis as a therapy. To reduce the former to the latter is to gain the instrument at the expense of truth. Psychoanalysis becomes merely medicine. I did not want to commend it, psychoanalysis, to your interest as a method of treatment, but on account of the truths it contains, as a method of treatment it is one among many. For exactly this reason, Freud opposed the monopolization of psychoanalysis by medical doctors as degrading psychoanalysis to therapy. Almost forgotten is the vigor with which Freud defended lay analysis, and today, perhaps, least known of his major works is his lucid and lively question of lay analysis. We do not consider it at all desirable for psychoanalysis to be swallowed up by medicine, and to find its last resting place in a textbook of psychiatry under the heading of methods of treatment. Freud honed the revolutionary edge of psychoanalysis. He fought its professionalization and domestication. He wanted to preserve psychoanalysis as a theory, not, ex not exclusively as a trade. I do not know if you have detected the secret link between the question of lay analysis and the future of an illusion, he wrote to Oscar Feister. In the former, I wish to protect analysis from the doctors, and in the latter, from the priests. I should like to hand it over to a profession which does not yet exist, a profession of lay curers of souls, who need not be doctors and should not be priests. As he stated, 
I only want to feel assured the therapy will not destroy the science. Lay analysts are essential to psychoanalysis, Freud told Smiley Blanton, because the psychiatrist who takes up psychoanalysis is interested in the therapeutic needs chiefly. This aim is not to be disparaged, but it is not the main or even the essential aim of psychoanalysis. The chief aim of psychoanalysis is to contribute to the science of psychology and to the world of literature and life in general. It is not without interest that Freud foresaw that the stripping of theory from psychoanalysis would be a particularly North American phenomenon. In this sense, Freud anticipated and feared the neo and post Freudians as his successors and betrayers. And he correctly adjudged a cultural climate of optimism and utilitarianism that would repress the discovery of repression. Freud remarked to Fra Franz Alexander that under the pressure of success and pragmatism, he was afraid the Americans would turn psychoanalysis into a watered down eclectic kind of treatment procedure. And he considered that Otto Rank's shortened therapy was designed to accelerate the tempo of analytic therapy to suit the rush of American life. He wrote not long before his death that the fate of psychoanalysis in America was that of a handmaid to American psychiatry. It did not develop into an independent, autonomous discipline. This fate reminded him of the parallelism in the fate of our Vienna ladies, who by exile have been turned into housemaids serving in English households. If it would be wrong to state that Freud formulated the problem of theory and therapy just as critical theory does, so too would it be wrong to argue that he did not articulate the contradiction. Freud resisted the debasement of psychoanalysis to an instrument of medicine or pure therapy because he fathomed to what degree this entailed the subjugation of psychoanalysis to the given social order that it was to comprehend. Reduced in this way, psychoanalysis loses its truth value. My discoveries are not primarily a heal-all, he wrote to H.D. My discoveries are a basis for a very grave philosophy. I have become a therapist against my will, he wrote to Wilhelm Fleece. He told Abram Cardiner, I am not basically interested in therapy. And he remarked ironically, we do analysis for two reasons, to understand the unconscious and to make a living. Freud continually rebuked what he called therapeutic optimism or enthusiasm. This was a claim to cure quickly and or completely. If, civil if civilization was repressive and neurosis was deeply entangled in the unconscious, cures could only be protracted and partial. He wrote of Sandor Ferenczi, one of the first to depart from Freud in emphasizing the therapeutic potential of psychoanalysis, that the need to cure and to help had become paramount in him. He had probably set himself aims which, with our therapeutic means, are altogether out of reach today out of reach because the neurosis was informed by deep-seated psychological and social determinants that severely hampered any immediate cure. The expectation that every neurotic phenomenon can be cured, he wrote, may be derived from the layman's belief that the neuroses are something quite not unnecessary, which have no right whatever to exist. The disjunction between the immediate therapeutic possibilities of happiness and health and the repressive whole that precluded just such possibilities is to be found even in Freud's least social writing, in his essays and remarks on psychoanalytic therapeutic technique. Here it is clear that Freud remained true to the meta-theory and was continually alert to the social conditions that damned individual therapy to impotence. Even more to the point that individual neurosis was a response to brutal, brutal social conditions, it is pointless for the doctor to aim to cure. The unresolved irony of psychoanalytic therapy within an unfree society is that it is possible only when it is impossible. That it is possible only when it is impossible. Psychoanalysis meets the optimum of favorable conditions where its practice is not needed, i.e. among the healthy. To cure in an unhealthy surrounding entailed redoing the social reality. To refuse the latter was to refuse the former. Freud stated that the doctor must occasionally take sides with the illness which he is attacking. It is not for him to confine himself in all situations in life to the part of fanatic about health. He knows that there is other misery in the world besides neurotic misery, real unavoidable suffering, that necessity may even demand of a man that he sacrifices health to it. 
Freud took to task the attitude of fanatic hygienists or therapists. They forget the very necessity of neuroses. Neuroses possess social justification. And should one really require such sacrifices in order to exterminate the neuroses, while the world is all the same, full of other in- inextinguishable mi- miseries? Especially within the poor classes, the neuroses contain a raison d'etre, that of survival, that precluded curing without changing the social conditions. It renders the sufferer too good service in the struggle for existence. For this reason, there could be no real individual solution, only a social one. In matters of prophylaxis, the individual is almost helpless. The whole community must take an interest in the matter and give its assent to the construction of measures valid for, for all. There's a great deal which must be changed. Nor is the class nature of existing psychoanalytic therapy veiled by Freud. We are but a handful of people whose work is restricted to the well-to-do classes. Given the vast amount of neurotic misery, the quantity we can do away with is almost negligible. For this reason, Freud backed the idea of state, state psychoanalytic clinics for the poor. He stated at the anniversary of one psychoanalytic clinic the Berlin Institute, that it made psychoanalytic therapy available to the great multitude of people who suffer from neuroses no less than the rich. In a letter from Freud to Putnam, the dialectic of therapy and social change is fully articulated. Therapy utterly lucid as to its limits and strength within a repressive society issues into a social critique and praxis of liberation. The importance of separating the two moments of psychoanalysis as therapy and as theory is here enunciated. I believe that your complaint that we are not able to to compensate our neurotic patients for giving up their illness is quite justified, but it seems to me that this is not the fault of therapy, but rather of social institutions. What would you have us do when a woman complains about her thwarted life? When, with youth gone, she notices that she has been deprived of the joy of loving for merely conventional reasons. She is quite right, and we stand helpless before her. But the recognition of our therapeutic limitations reinforces our determination to change other social factors so that men and women shall no longer be forced into hopeless situations. It was not lost to Freud that the impulse behind the innovations in classical therapy, the tendency to absorb theory by therapy, was a humanist one. Because Freud emphasized the protracted nature of therapy, the restricted range of applicability, and the minimal results, everyday unhappiness, the humanist response sought to abridge therapy, extend its applicability, and promise more. The differences surfaced most clearly in the question of the analytic situation itself, where analyst and patient met. The classic posture was that of non-activity on the part of the analyst, The analyst was not to act or react to the patient with open love, warmth, affection, or other emotions. If anything, the reverse. Freud recommended a coldness in feeling and the model of the surgeon who puts aside all his own feelings, including that of human sympathy. He rejected the expedient of sham affection as an aid to therapy. Psychoanalytic treatment is founded on truthfulness. It is dangerous to depart from this sure foundation. To the humanist innovators, these directions smacked of indifference and cynicism. Ferenczi was one of the first to introduce activity and affection into the analytic situation, which paralleled his therapeutic optimism. It is not without reason that the Neo-Freudians have always been ardent defenders of Ferenczi and have followed his lead in stressing the role of affection and love. Clara Thompson herself, a Neo-Freudian, lists two contributions of frenzy. The analytic situation is a human situation in which two human beings attempt a sincere relationship, and one must give the patient the love he needs. As one enthusiastic, enthusiastic partisan of frenzy has written, psychoanalytic cure is in direct proportion to the cherishing love given by the psychoanalyst to the patient. Neo and post Freudians have made variants of this their program. Fromm, in an essay from 1935, interpreted the difference between activity and non activity as that between warm affection and inhuman indifference. He wrote that the contrast between Frenzy and Freud was one of principle. 
the contradiction between a humane philanthropic attitude that affirmed in an unrestricted manner the happiness of the patient and a patriarchal authoritarian attitude, which was in essence misanthropic tolerance. Adorno refers to this type of criticism of Freud's coldness and inhumanity. It assumes that love and happiness are to be attained by their mere affirmation. Rather, Freud's coldness does mankind more honor than a false warmth that is to be turned on and off by command, snatches of the ideology of sensitivity. Freudian analysis is the steadfast penetration of the injured psyche. It takes so seriously the damage that it offers nothing for the immediate. If Freud mentions the surgeon as an analog to the analyst, it is because neither promises that the internal wounds can be smiled away. The psychic surgery is not inhumane. Rather, it is a just appraisal of the damages wrought by inhumanity. The accent on the reverse immediate warmth emotions threatens the indifference. The different wounds are covered by a blanket, blanket warmth for all. In a cold and cheerless world, universal love and sensitivity is an impossibility. If it dared to be concrete, it would quickly be exhausted. It is sustained only by ignoring the individual scars of its object, brutalized humanity. In fact, it seconds the damage by degenerating into a tool, an art of loving, indifferent toward the object and applicable without distinction. Adorno likes to cite this sentence from civilization and its discontents. A love that does not discriminate seems to me to forfeit a part of its own value by doing an injustice to its object. Yet a love that does discriminate is no longer purely subjective. To be sure, prevailing positivism renders the notion of objective analysis of love and happiness unthinkable. It decrees facts to be object objective and shelves the leftovers as poetry. To critical theory, however, the notions of love and happiness are fragments of a social theory. Individual love, to be sure, must be subjective, but this is precisely the point. Today it is objective, but billed as the reverse. It is prey in form and content to society. Again, the dialectic, the subjectivity that parades its authenticity covers for a social reality that commands. For subjectivity to attain itself, to become subjective, it must achieve self-consciousness, insight into the objective reality that falsifies the subject. Without this consciousness, the subject is ideological, a tool of a repressive society. This was exactly the drift of Adorno's critique of Kierkegaard's conception of love. Kierkegaard's inner and purely subjective love, indifferent toward the object, was conformist and ideological. The fetishized love reveals um, a cold and feelingless core, indifferent toward the actual world. This dialectic of love leads to lovelessness. Eschewing insight and reality, <clears throat> love and sensitivity erode to the purely subjective, a blind and blank attitude. The coldness of warm, subjective love dwells, dwells in its refusal to glimpse the social mechanism that creates coldness. The obdurate clinging to subjective love drives it into its opposite, an apology for a loveless world. Marcuse's thoughtful essay from the 1930s on hedonism pursues the contradiction. Happiness does not drop from the sky. It is grounded in personal needs, which in turn are cut and shaped by extra-personal realities and forces. The subjective happiness in its immediacy, the happiness that satisfies the individual, is already objective in that it does not arise from the deep recesses of the non-social individual, but from the entanglement of the individual with social structures and tensions. Happiness over a, few, over a new car is happiness that has been drilled in, not spontaneously hatched. A subjective happiness that adamantly maintains its subjectivity. Oh, this turned off. The subjective happiness in its immediacy, the happiness that satisfies the individual. Fuck, I feel I totally lost my spot. I'm so sorry. A subjective happiness that adamantly maintains its subjectivity is one of resignation. It takes the prevailing form of happiness as natural and human. It accepts the wants and interests of individuals as simply given and as valuable in themselves. Yet these wants and interests themselves, and not merely their gratification, already contain the stunted growth 
the repression and the untruth with which men grow up in class society. An antinomy arises that is the misery of life in bourgeois society, a critique of the given and subjective needs and gratifications, a critique unveiling the degree to which they are social modes, unfree and unhappy, is one which exposes the social reality that blocks and, and mangles individual happiness. Yet in showing the distance between the prevailing subjective happy unhappiness and happiness within and identical to freedom, it diminishes the present pleasures. Knowledge and happiness diverge in an unfree society. Knowledge destroys proffered happiness. Knowledge does not help him, the individual, attain happiness. Yet without it, he reverts to reified rela relationships. This is an inescapable dilemma. Enjoyment and truth, happiness, and the essential relations of individuals are disjunctions. This is a historical disjunction, not a natural one. It is the configuration of happiness and freedom in an unliberated society, a society in which the modes of happiness are unfree and the modes of freedom unhappy. Today, one vies with the other. Every solution is the wrong one.